of the point of, of creating Adaptive Path back, way back then, 2001, was to, uh, to get design a seat at the table. And that was our goal, a seat at the table. And I think, you know, I was, I was just listening to Brandon talk about, like, you know, bringing design to business and the successful things that we have done since then. It feels a little bit like that's turned around now, that we have our own tables and that we can invite business or technology to that table. But that product design and the experience that you have with the products has been the thing that's won. And now we're just trying to figure out what we do with all this power we got. Like, oh my God, like it worked, and what do we do? And I, of course, uh, every company is different. That's all over the shop. But I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the things that I've, I've learned around what do we do, that uh, running products from a design perspective, and ultimately, how do we achieve what I think is one of the most important things in all product design, and that's momentum. I'm going to uh, do that by starting uh, with a confession, or maybe just a little thing I'd like to share about myself, and that is that I'm a very passionate cyclist. Uh, this is a photo that I took uh, on the Marin Headlands. Uh, this is me uh, a couple months ago uh, being fit for a new bike. You might, I, can't, I, can't, I don't know if you can tell from there, but I'm extraordinarily tall. And uh, uh, it's difficult for me to buy both my clothing and a bicycle off the rack. Uh, so, oh, let's go back one, sorry. So this is uh, me getting fit uh, so that they can actually, so a guy can make a bike that will actually fit me. And it's, uh, if you are into technology, this is just amazing. Like, those are the uh, John Cameron, like, avatar sort of uh, things that uh, do motion capture. And I'm riding the bike and there's a computer in front of me and I can see a little stick figure of me riding as I do and it's me and it's, and they've got all these, all this data that's, that's flowing through and the guy then adjusts the sort of frame underneath me until we kind of hit the perfect uh, efficiency. Um, that was awesome. That was incredibly fun. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about cycling because I have this passion for it and there's a lot in it uh, that I think is totally relevant to the kind of uh, work that we do. So. Um, one of the things I do every year still, even after all the controversy and everything that's happened, is, is watch the Tour de France, and I'm passionate about the Tour de France as well. Um, if there's any Euro Europeans in the audience, I apologize ahead of time. Americans don't know anything about cycling, so I'm just going to give a very quick introduction. Uh, it's a big race in July. It goes for three weeks, uh, and they go all the way around the country, and they go clockwise one year and counterclockwise the other year. Uh, they go up in the Alps. They go up in the Pyrenees. It's a pretty remarkable thing. It's probably one of the most difficult sporting events uh, in the world in that they ride 100, 120 miles every day through these mountains and whatnot for three solid weeks. And uh, there's a really interesting thing that happens every day. The guy who is winning will have a whole bunch of reporters around him and they will say, what are your chances today? How does it look today? How do you feel today? And he just very calmly looks straight into the camera and says, I will win as if there were never any question with this unbelievable amount of confidence. Somebody, hopefully the same guy, but somebody will come across the finish line later that day in first place. And all the cameras will come back and they will say, it looked like you had a motor on your bike. You rode like crazy. How did you do it? How did you do it? And he always says, whoever it is, the team was very strong today. And that's a thing to keep in mind here. Like, if you're not familiar with cycling, you may not think that this thing here is a team sport. It does sort of appear like you have a whole group of people hurling themselves towards the finish line, hoping that one person gets across the line, but it's not like that at all. And in fact, it's very focused on a set of teams. There's like 12 teams that ride in the Tour de France. They have 11 cyclists each, and they work together very, very carefully to get one person across the team. And the reason for that is that almost everything you can learn about cycling strategy, you can learn from this photograph right here, which is that if somebody is moving ahead of you and you're behind that person, it's easier for you to move because you're not in the wind. It is, uh, there are examples throughout nature of how this works. And it works very well like that in cycling as well. So what happens is you will have a cyclist who is riding along and they will be riding through the wind and the wind sort of looks like that. And if somebody gets behind them, right, they can save about 40% of their effort. So the entire race is about getting around France as quickly as you can with never being in the wind. So you will have a team and you will have one person leading that team 
And if that person is winning the race, they will be wearing a yellow jersey so that you can pick them out. You can always see the leader go by as they go on the road. Uh, so you can right, pick them out. You can see this, this uh, yellow jersey go by. But they have a lot of people right, that ride with them. And they have a variety of specialists that help them in various parts of the race. You'll have a couple of guys that look like jockeys, really, really strong jockeys. They will weigh maybe 120 pounds, uh, and these are the climbing specialists. When they go up the mountain, they go ahead, the leader then hangs onto their wheel, and off they go up, uh, and they will spend the entire day just getting up one hill, pulling that leader along. There are the sprinters, big uh, track bike-looking guys uh, that will uh, ride uh, to the finish line as fast as possible. The last four or five kilometers they will drag and they will be going you know, 40 miles, 50 miles an hour, pulling their leader up to the finish line and sort of catapulting that person across, essentially. Uh, and then, uh, and this is what those stages tend to look like. I'll talk more about that in a sec. Uh, and then you have what they call the domestiques, right? It's a French sport, a lot of French language in it. The domestiques are uh, basically the hired help. These are typically young riders that uh, have ambitions someday to be amazing, but it's their job to basically do anything else that they're asked, right? So they will go to the back of the race. The race never stops. So they go to the back and uh, go get snacks or something for the team leader and bring that forward. You'll see them riding up with water for the rest of the team as they ride back up. Uh, it is a thankless job, but they're putting in the hours and, and the effort so that someday they may be leaders as well. Um, thankless, in fact, is quite a dangerous job. This kind of stuff happens. And part of the thrill, right? Like we watch NASCAR or whatever to see the crashes, and we have the crashes in the cycling as well. So, uh, so yeah, that's how you get to be a team leader is you. You pay your dues that way. Uh, there are many races inside the one race, so it makes it really exciting. It's not just watching for four hours a day after day seeing who will get to Paris first, but there's all kinds of stuff happening inside. So on the flatter stages, there will be a bunch of uh, uh, sprint points where the first person across four or five different lines gets points and you accumulate points over time. And the person with the most points gets the green jersey, the fastest, right, sort of sprinter. Uh, they typically won't contend overall because they'll fall apart in the mountains, right? The mountain stages, which are crazy, like they look like, the profile looks like that, it's insane. Uh, has points at the top of each one of those peaks, and somebody will throw themselves at trying to get all those points and come out with the king of the mountains, the polka dot jer jersey. Uh, and there's lots more, too. There's the uh, white jersey for the youngest rider under 26 with the best time, and then there's the team classification where you aggregate the, the team overall, and, the, uh, uh, and there's awards for all of this, so lots of races happening inside, making a very strategic race day by day and super, super interesting. Uh, it's 100 years old, it's more than 100 years old, and the race has changed a lot. They don't smoke a lot during the race anymore. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the very early problems with the Tour de France was the unbelievable amount of cheating that was going on. So that's not new at, as well. Uh, though it typically used to be the fans that would cheat. Their guy would go past and then they'd throw tacks in the road. And, or even tackle, like, you know, they didn't have camera coverage everywhere. They would just like pull a guy off and, you know, and go, 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 and get their guy going and stuff like that. So, but there is a tremendous history here, and it's a, it's a phenomenal race. And one of the things I love most about it uh, is uh, not just that it's this huge, giant spectacle, right? This is what follows the riders down the road as they go every day uh, during this race. But the other part of that is that they ride on roads that you can ride, right? Like half of these people are dressed like cyclists on the side because they just rode to this point, got off their bikes, and watched the pros go by from inches away. And it's that kind of access to, to the, uh, the heroes of your sport that we don't have very often in, in many other sports. And they ride through some of the, just the most beautiful places in the world, uh, beautiful scenery. It's just a gorgeous thing to watch. Uh, so I'd encourage you to sort of look at that. But um, if, uh, if I think about what's important of all of that, it was what we can take out of there about leadership. Right, because I, I was talking to Brandon earlier uh, uh, this morning, and he was saying there, there was sort of a theme yesterday, a couple of people talking about the difference between management and leadership. And it's one of the things that I have uh, probably, you know, admittedly struggled with in my career, is mixing those two things up. Thinking that having a lot of direct reports and being responsible for lots and lots of projects was a way of leading good design in a company. 
But in fact, what I found out I was doing was mostly going to meetings and looking at spreadsheets. And I think few of us are, have the ability, right, to do both uh, uh, exclusively. Like I can be purely a manager or I can be purely a leader. It's always a blend, right? But separating those tasks and understanding them and seeing where your strengths are is the thing that's really important. And so I'm really impressed with this idea of standing up in front of a team and thinking it's all about them. That leadership comes from the reflection back on your team for the amazing abilities they have. The team was very strong. So I look for inspiration for this kind of stuff all over the place. There's easy places to look for that in other creative fields, for example, in the movies. This is Steven Soderbergh. Uh, I'm a huge fan of his work, director, who's done an amazing amount of work in his, in his career over the last 20, 25 years, and has just recently retired from filmmaking to focus on painting full time. Um, but he's made some movies uh, that you most certainly have heard of, like Traffic and Sex, Lies, and Videotape, and stuff like that really brought an in independent uh, sensibility into Hollywood. I read an interview with him recently uh, that was very inspiring, and I have a few quotes that I think can frame some stuff for us. <laughs> he said during that that some people believe tension is a good creative tool. But I am not one of those people. <laughs> I like that. I really agree with that. And we're going to be talking about momentum here today, and that can feel like stress, right? We're going faster. We're going faster. But he tries to combat that, right? He stands in front of his team. He's talking about the actors here. He says, I'm not trying to control them, right? Make them into marionettes on the ends of strings that he has in his hands, but rather that he's looking to amplify and showcase whatever it is he finds compelling about them. What a way to frame your teams. Right? How can I amplify what you guys are doing so we can achieve a vision? And he does that by keeping the environment relaxed but focused. Relaxed but focused is something that I love. Where you can go fast and you can make deadlines and you can be ahead of the competition, but you can be relaxed while you do it. He uh, talks about a form of humor that he tries to cultivate inside his teams, inside jokes and references that only a core group of people understand. I love that. I really do like that. Um, he's talking about a creative environment. And this is something I put a lot of emphasis on when I work with my teams. Uh, and it's not just a great office, though that goes a long way. But it is the sort of thing that people need when they come to a space like this. They need things like being able to trust one another, right? That knowing that they can go out on a limb and that's going to work out. That they have a shared sense of values, and you talk about those values all the time, and they're not just these sort of hand-waving big picture things, but they're incorporated into every single thing that they do, that they feel safe uh, while they're doing their work, that they can take risks, right? And they know that they have both the authority and the responsibility associated with those risks, but that that's fair, and people are good at that, and that there's a sense of camaraderie about the team, that we make amazing stuff, and we are a team that does that. And then, yeah, there are some physical things that actually come in handy when you're doing this kind of stuff, right? Uh, that try to communicate, like, you guys are important. All of you are important. And we are going to give you the things you need to get your job done, even if it doesn't look like you know, tools for writing code or designing interfaces. So that creative environment is something that I want to apply to this concept of momentum. And I want to give us a slightly different idea of momentum as well as we go into this. And that is not necessarily this. Momentum does not need to equal speed. Momentum does not need to equal speed. When I look up things like velocity in, in product development, I find, like, look, this is agile velocity in Google image search. What do we see? Ah, yeah, I mean, this, this stuff is great, right? But at the same time, I personally, in my form of leadership, go crazy if this is the way that we apply this kind of thinking to the work that we do. This is, this is the, the worst form of management, I believe, right? It's great, it's super important, right? But it is, if this is all we have and we don't have the stuff that Steven Soderbergh was talking about, we're in trouble. Team efficiency, team velocity, measured week by week. <gasps> when do we take a breath, right? This stuff comes from, uh, comes from uh, a historical approach to this stuff, the sort of industrial revolution, right? Uh, the uh, Frederick, Frederick, I can't remember his first name. Oh yeah, Frederick, there it is. Frederick Taylor, Taylorism, scientific management. Turn of the 20th century, right? This guy is enormously influential at applying 
the scientific method to the way in which work happens, which had not yet been done, right? And this is where you see that sort of stuff where uh, people are walking around while workers are like assembling things or, or shoveling, right? And they have the stopwatch and they're looking for the best, most efficient way to do the work. And if we were before in an age of craftsmanship, I don't think we've lost that, but, but what they needed to do was apply some kind of rigor to that, right? To find some kind of efficiency, to achieve some kind of profitability. This is a quote from, uh, that I found of his that sort of sums up this notion of management. One of the very first requirements of a man who's fit to handle iron is that he resembles in his mental makeup the ox. <laughs> and he found this troubling, right? He would say, the workman who is best suited to handling the iron is unable to understand the real science of doing this class of work. He is unable to make himself better because he is strong, but the grinding repetitiveness of the work means we can only have ox-like people doing it. So he invented the manager, right, to sort of be smart but not have to lift. So where do we find the balance in this, right? And, and totally, admittedly, my first reaction to all this stuff is like, well, come on, it was 100 years ago, right? And 100 years ago, work looked like this. It's not like super advanced like we have today, right? So, <laughs> sorry, it's just an aside. But, but really, how do we find the blend? Right? The, the emotional, the passion of leadership with the efficiency and profitability and sustainability, frankly, of the more rational. Because right? I think we all have both inside of us, so we need to figure out the difference between the two of them. So let's apply this, right? Sorry, there's also, like, this is, this is exactly what happens in the, the world of cycling. That we have the passionate leader that's up front dragging the, you know, being being dragged by the team across France. You also have the guy in the car that's following it, the team, the directeur sportif, the team manager, who is responsible for all the resources that the team needs, all the space to do all this amazing work, all the extra bikes, <laughs> everything they need is handled by this guy. Management, leadership, very, very important symbiosis between the two. So instead of this, as a way of thinking about all of that, uh, of momentum and speed and going forward and going faster, I want to think a little bit more like this that we can define momentum as a, as a way forward, right? As a path, as a set, as a, a sort of structure that points to where we want to go. And that there's times to go fast and there's times to go slow. And identifying when those times are, when we should step back and think, or when we should lean forward and work. And that's very, very important. There's times when we'll be efficient, there's times when we will be appearing to sitting at our desk staring out the window and both are very important. So I want to frame that as these things we can use. I'm going to talk about five different meetings that we have in, had our, in our startup and have persisted now. I love this. Meetings, right? There's irony in me talking about meetings, because this is generally how I feel, right? The practical alternative to work is a meeting. Uh, and if my, my short experience now at Adobe is any indication, like some people really love to just go to meetings. I love it. But I don't believe it's a practical alternative work. I think you have to put a lot of effort into making those meetings incredibly important. So let me talk about five meetings that we had uh, and continue to have uh, with, with my most recent team and, um, and how we made them an effective structure to hang very creative work off of, a framework that, uh, that put some constraints on the design of the user experience and the, and the product itself that we were that we're creating. And uh, so I'll cheat a tiny bit. And that the first one is not a meeting. It's an antithesis of meetings. Uh, and that is meeting number zero, the chat room. This is the place where we always congregate and always do our work. It is like a meeting uh, in that everybody is together and everybody's uh, uh, attention is there. But it's not. Also, my, my developers have finally uh, taught me to start all counting at zero. So this is an achievement for them as well. Um, but the chat room. This is something that works very well for us, and it's a very technical group of people that I have creating this thing, and so this works. But we have the chat room running all the time. Always, always running, always the place where you know you can go to be with the team. Uh, we happen to use Campfire from 37 Signals. There's a whole host of uh, clients, so you don't have to actually have it in a web browser window. You can run it on your phone and stuff like that. Works really well for us. There's Yammer, there's all kinds of other solutions as well. If you're super old school, you can use IRC. But we use the chat 
uh, as a way to act distributed, even if we aren't. Even if our, there's weird exp experiences of sitting in a room with 15 people and suddenly having the room start laughing and you're the one that's not in the chat room right now. You know, like that stuff happens. But I love this because we're never all in the same room together. And in fact, I don't want us to all be in the same room together. I don't mind the fact that some people like to work really late, but we're going to go home. That's all fine. We act distributed, even if we're not. And there's two things I really like about our chat room and the way that we use it. One is communication compression. If you think about this, how many of you could get like a two or three paragraph email from your boss asking for a bunch of stuff, and then you reply to that email by saying, no, no send. <laughs> Anybody? A couple people? Right on. <laughs> Let's talk afterwards. Uh, I agree. Uh, it is both a sort of hierarchy structure, uh, hierarchy thing, but there's also email is, you, you start a letter. You have a subject line. Dear so-and-so, thank you for your message. I have reviewed what you said, and I think now is not the best time. Like, you write paragraphs, right? Whereas in your chat room, we can have conversations much more like this to achieve the same thing and avoid a meeting, right, to just talk about the decision. But this happens continuously. <laughs> Regardless of who, who's talking to whom and their relative uh, set of responsibilities or hierarchy or whatever, this allows us to have momentum, much more momentum, because it's always there, right? Or you know that if the person is not there, you can see when they come back, and there's presence, and there's that kind of stuff, and, and everybody understands if I'm not on chat, I'm busy, like very focused, and all that kind of stuff. But there's another reason I chose this particular screenshot, because you'll see at the very bottom here, right, that this entry is written by the type kit robot, robot. And that's a whole set of scripts that has its own account and has a sort of life, and it goes and talks to all the systems that we have and reports from those APIs back into the chat room. This is important, right? Because I've heard so many people say, yeah, great, you know, you're always advocating the chat room, and then I like, make the chat room, and I sit there all by myself all day. I can't get people to come in. So what we did was make the things that people needed to do their job available only in the chat room, right? The robot would come in, and the robot would do this sort of uh, reporting in. I call it ambient accountability. You can see how the team is doing, just getting a sense by going through the scroll back every morning and stuff like that. Code deploys, pull requests, right? These are all part of the technical parts, but even the support tickets pop up there automatically. The revenue events, right, when we have uh, do accounts and stuff like that, all of that is popping up, and that's where people go to see did the thing that I just do, right? Was it successful? Do I need to keep working at it? And stuff like that. So a community forms. It is not really the water cooler. It is actually like the control room where people are. Um, it's also, like, this is funny, right? To say, like, also the latest, latest animated GIFs <laughs> show up in the chat room. But I think this is crucial for, uh, for a culture to emerge as well. There's a whole thing happening with animated GIFs and people sharing this, and it's very funny, and that's great. But imagine you announce something like, we launched this thing, and I'm super proud about it, and you go to the chat room, and the chat room looks like this, right? <laughs> Everyone's like, woohoo! We did it, we launched that thing, right? It feels good, it makes you want to keep going, right? This is, this is the kind of like, I don't know, in other companies it's peer reviews, right, and stuff like that, or spot bonuses and stuff. You can tell people are into what you're doing when they give you one of these. And you can tell you've done a super good job if you get the ultimate, right, which is the, Chuck Norris, thumbs up. <laughs> Piece of culture, works for our team, works, uh, could potentially work in, in other teams. So let's look at some of the meetings. The first one is a stand-up. Like I said, I'm not very much into the agile methodology, but I am into this bit of it, which is every morning we have a meeting, everybody in the company sits and talks about what we're doing, right? I, I, I was always inspired by it. A long time ago, when I was much younger, there was a show called Hill Street Blues. Remember Hill Street Blues? Remember the beginning of it all the time? All the cops are sitting around, they're drinking coffee, they're making fun of, of each other and stuff like that. And this guy gets up and runs down like all the stuff, right? Like, we haven't found the murderer yet, and uh, people are double parking too much on 17th Avenue, and all that kind of stuff, right? He does that, and uh, then he says, okay, that's everything on the list, and everybody stands up and he goes, wait, 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 let's be careful out there. Remember that? That was always great. What a great way to start the show. Well, that's what we do every morning, everybody in the company. We have a stand-up. We all sit down, but we, uh, uh, but, we, but we do this religiously 
and incredibly structured. It starts at 10.05. We do that so you cannot be late. You have no excuse. You can't be like, oh, it's 10, I better go, right? 10.05, we start talking, and if you aren't there, you're going to miss stuff that you need to do your job. Everybody comes, everybody in the company. The office manager comes to the stand-up. Everybody is there, it's the life of the thing, right? Uh, our company grew to 25. Admittedly, I don't know if it would work at 50 or 100 or 200, uh, but it worked up to 25, so it could be one per product group. It could be something like that. But everybody who was responsible for something uh, in the life of our company came, but nobody was allowed to talk except for one person or if you owned one of the big projects. So there was probably two, three people that were allowed to speak in this, in this meeting. And that was crucial as well because we are not solving problems in this meeting. It's so tempting to say, I have to do this today, but I'm stuck on this. And somebody says, oh yeah, you know what we could do? Done, now the meeting's gonna be an hour long and we're shooting for 15 minutes. If it's 10.20 and we're still sitting there, something is wrong. No matter how much we're working on, we have gotta go fast and we have gotta get through all of this stuff. No laptops, I don't want somebody like checking email or doing something else while we are with each other saying, this is today's agenda, see you tomorrow, right? This works incredibly well, but it has to be rigorous. This is uh, Matthew, oh sorry, this is our, uh, our entire whole huge project tracking system, which is an email where we write down what we decided each day uh, with uh, status of each project, that's it. Somebody types on the one laptop that's allowed to be open, and they type with that uh, on the screen, and we talk uh, and go through each one of these stuff, things, and then shoo, send out the email at 10.20, uh, and that's it. So this uh, is Matthew. Matthew is our head of sales. I think that's the exact right uh, sort of attitude to have if you're the head of sales, because it, well, it works very well for him. He's always really sort of grumpy and stuff like that. He, on his one year anniversary, shared his notes from his first day, uh, from his first week uh, at Typekit. And this is what he wrote about our stand-up. Management artifacts that might be treated with breezy indifference by other startups are fully fetishized by Typekit. The daily status call demands surgical precision. Each one lasts no longer than 70 seconds. See, a little hyperbolic, that's fine. Uh, and you have nine syllables to make your point, choose them wisely. <laughs> but here's what we're trying to do, right? The two most important qualities in an engineer, I think, are laziness and hubris. That's what you want, right? You want somebody who will never do the same task twice, ever. Therefore, if they are confronted with this task more than once, they will use their hubris to solve this problem once and for all. All of that, right, sort of means they don't have time for this. They don't have time for this. This has to be a high bandwidth, very useful uh, meeting for me, or I am not going to pay attention. And it starts to crumble then. Surgical precision is what we use to combat that. Like, give me 15 minutes, and it will be bullet point by bullet point exactly what you need. And that works, and it works really well. So that's worked for us as, uh, as well. This, the, the meeting number two, the third one we'll talk about here is the week. Now this is Friday afternoon. This was an attempt to summarize what had happened last week, uh, or this week rather, summarize all the things that have happened, uh, and crack open the beers, right? That's basically what's, what goes on. It, it, so it's, it's sort of later in the day on uh, Friday every week. This is like here, these are the uh, screens that I've got from one about a year ago. Um, we cover uh, the kind of stuff you would, that, that traditionally can be kind of boring, right? Like this, like how are the numbers, oh, this whole look. Um, these are some of the, the slides from one, I think from that same one, yeah, this is from almost exactly a year ago, um, where we look at our progress. The reason why I'm showing this is that uh, we have a couple of things that happen regardless every week, right? But the rest of the time is unstructured and anybody can do sort of five, 10 minutes of whatever they're interested in. I think this would actually fail if every, everyone was required to. But this turns into a bit of a competition, right? Can I top what people have done before and show great stuff? So therefore the slides, with uh, running the risk of you know, working on meta stuff and not working on our jobs, the slides get be beautiful and gorgeous. This is from our uh, uh, support reporting. Uh, on topics. This is our A-B testing that we were running for a while, and you can see, like, this is how we reported out on that. I just, the people who are responsible for these things get, like, so into them. 
This is from our uh, uh, CTO talking about all the amazing stuff the engineers did that week. Here's from the person who manages our library who's going deep into this new typeface here and how it, you know, the closed counters are, are similar to some other font. We, we really look at that. And what ends up happening is that we, it feels like at the end of every Friday, we get these little TED Talks from people internally. And that's the thing. I tell people to go watch them all the time. Your first week here, go watch the following six TED Talks. That's what I want from, from this kind of stuff. When you talk about your work, right, let's do it like this. Uh, even if that feels a little intimidating, it's good because right now we're all, we're elevating what we believe are one of our values. And one of our values is clear communication, right, through uh, through sort of cutting edge aesthetics. That's the sort of one of the, the things. We can make the web more beautiful with Typekit. So they try, right, to make things more beautiful and I see this amazing work. But this is, you know, how do I get engineers to care about design? This is one of those techniques and we use this to do that. Uh, code review, or not code review, but like here's how some of the code is changing. This is stuff that people are doing. Uh, sales, uh, always, like here are the things that have closed. Um, and then we kind of go from there, right? People do this kind of stuff all the time. This is one of our engineers who is very excited about episode one, body text in Keynote. And he, for five minutes, he taught us how to make better presentations, right? Feeding back on itself. Twice a year, everybody, we're kind of distributed. We got some people on the East Coast and, and things like that. Twice a year, everybody flies in. We spend a week together. We call it Typekit Palooza. It's really fun. Uh, and we do this for the whole first morning. Everybody does like five minutes of something they're totally into, right? Like this is what we got. Uh, two, two uh, uh, yearly uh, reviews ago where one of our engineers who's from England taught us like why there's an Irish soccer team and I just on and on about all the ge geopolitical ramifications of sports teams at the Olympics for the British Isles. That was very interesting. But even this kind of stuff, right? Like this is here, this is the big project I worked on last, last year, says our CTO again, um, and stuff like that. So it brings a little bit of the humanity into this kind of stuff. A little bit of like sort of competition for one of the values that we hold, hold dear. Uh, and that works really well. So you can see we're zooming out a little bit, right? Start with the real time in the chat. Zoom out to the daily with the stand up into the weekly. Um, here's another great meeting, the product review. Uh, I do these quite frequently, but more ad hoc, right? So they're not quite as scheduled. But again, they're very, very structured. The product review uh, is when we take our work and we share it with the rest of the team to get feedback, uh, to get help, uh, that kind of stuff. This, is, this room right here is Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, 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 off of his office where his students would come and they would all share their work and they would sit and look. And while you would put a tree in the middle of the table in front of the work, I don't know, but he's the expert, so we'll leave that. But, the, um, <laughs> uh, but this is the room where they did their work. Now, I, maybe you've heard of Marissa Meyer's product reviews uh, from back at the Google days. I was there at that time. They didn't feel like this at all. They felt like this. This is what they felt. <laughs> Felt like, here's my beautiful clay pigeon of an idea, and then everybody would just go boom, 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 right? Like, <laughs> I got lots of opinions on your idea. So I wanted to change that, because I found the sort of periodic check-ins of asking for help or showing the work that you've been doing is really valuable, but not like that. So we put some, again, some constraint around what our product reviews would do. First of all, optional attendance, but participation mandatory. That means you don't have to come, but if you do come, right, you're there and you're not looking up and saying something that somebody, a point somebody made through, you know, 20 minutes ago. Not an opinion, not a forum for expressing opinions, right? Let me give you an example of that. This is bad when somebody says, I don't like that blue. What do you do with that? Do you go make it red? Like, what, what, is the, what is the point of saying that you don't like it, the blue? But instead, why is that blue is better? See what you've done? You've opened up and said, like, I have a question about a decision that you made. Can we talk about it? Or how about, is color important here? Let's talk about the decision-making process, right? The good, the bad, let's work through it. And that's one thing to use any meeting that you're in or any interaction with a colleague. If you disagree, ask questions until you fully understand why you disagree and are able to justify your disagreement rather than, I don't like that blue or whatever, all right? These are working sessions for group problem solving that are either convergent or divergent. Let me tell you the difference here, right? Divergent thinking uh, or a process is when you have one idea and you're looking for, to expand out to make sure you've got the scope of the solution space, right? That means 
I'm brainstorming. Right. I have, there's limitless possibility. Don't tell me that the database isn't structured that way. Just help me. Like, what could this be? This is my wife, Julie, uh, has done work, uh, 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 classes in improv and stuff like that. I'm fascinated by that, though. Haven't tried it yet. Uh, I like to try to be a little more rehearsed, but maybe that's a thing I should try. Uh, but she has always told me this, this idea in improv is you never shut anything down. Right? Somebody says, I'm on a bus. You go, it doesn't look like a bus. You know, they go, well, the scene is over. Right? So always yes. Always like, wow, yes, and. So we grow the idea space. And this is an awesome way to have a product review sometimes. Other times, we need to take all of these ideas that we have had and boil down to one idea, one thing we will launch. It's a very different process. In this case, we're going to evaluate the feasibility. No, we can't do that because our database doesn't work that way. That's important to know at this point, once we have exhausted the product, the idea space. We need to drive towards consensus in this one. And these need to be different and identified at the beginning. This is a divergent product review in which I wish to look at all the possible solutions for the search results page. This is a convergent one in which we have to decide if this thing that I'm going to put on the screen is going to work. And we need to identify those up front. And that, oh my god, that helps so much more than having the sort of, well, that awful sort of the hippo process, right, which is the uh, highest paid person's opinion, right? That's, that's how product review tends to happen uh, when we're not structured around this kind of stuff, and I don't like that happening. So. What you need is, again, this sense of good taste on your team so there's trust and you're not going to spend a bunch of time evaluating ideas from people that are not uh, as well versed in what we're trying to do. The best way to build good taste on your team is more exposure to users. The more they see their users trying to get things done, right? their usability is great, and I love all of that. But what I find so valuable is having people watch people struggle with the thing they're making. right? More empathy, better taste, better solutions. Likewise, right? we spend a lot of time on the team talking about great design, more exposure to great work. I love, so Adobe recently acquired this company called Behance, which is a creative social network, and, and there's such great examples all the time of beautiful work. And we talk about why the work is beautiful, so much so that we collectively, once a week, spotlight. These are, uh, this is obviously marketing, right? That we say these are the best sites using our fonts. But these are chosen by engineers, by product support people, by salespeople. These are the best sites that we found. And we talk about it because more discussion leads to a better vocabulary. So the last meeting is the post-mortem with a frowny face, because we never want to have these. These are meetings that we have when something terrible has happened. Now, I'm a firm believer that part of the design process is, goes all the way through the launching of code, right? That we have these people on our team that do a remarkable job of this new sort of product development where we deploy new code on a daily basis, generally multiple times a day. That means multiple times a day, somebody pushes the button to deploy new code to the site with the intent of making the site better. Sometimes when we push the button, the site does not get better. The site goes away. <laughs> the fewer times we can do that, the better, right? But that happens sometimes. And I remember talking to John Allspaw, who's a CTO of e uh, no, not eBay, sorry, uh, Etsy. And he was telling me, nobody ever thinks they're going to take the site down when they push the button. They always think they're going to do the right thing. So something has happened. Something somewhere has happened, but nobody is criminally trying to bring your site down on your team, or you have much bigger problems. <laughs> but it is human nature to vilify, to say, who did this? Who is responsible for this? It is it's so much so that we have a name for this in psychology. It's called the fundamental attribution error. That means we are highly likely to attribute attributes to somebody rather than acknowledge circumstances as the reason for failure. Attributes of the person are responsible, not the circumstances in which they were performing. Right? This happens all the time. I saw this when I was a kid. Right? My dad would be driving, and we'd be uh, you know, sitting in the back. And anybody who passed us was insane. And anybody going slower than us was an idiot. Right? And we'd be driving along, and some guy would go by, and he'd be like, look at that guy. He's insane. He's trying to kill us all. 
And then we would go flying by somebody and go like, what an idiot is parked here. What's he doing? Right. Right, looking at attributes of the people, right? They are either, right, they've got some kind of mental deficiency or they are just a complete idiot. Uh, and that's what we do all the time. Who did this, right? Talk about eroding trust. If you think every time you push that button multiple times a day, I could be bringing the site down and they're gonna point their finger at me, you're not gonna have the kind of trust risk taking that we really actually want. And there's a solution to this and we can look to post-World War II Japan for this solution. A guy called Sakichi Toyoda, who was sort of the father of the Industrial Re Revolution post-war in Japan. He made a car company with a more Americanized spelling of his name. Uh, he brought industry and quality back by doing something very simple. Whenever there was a problem, he would ask, why did this problem happen? He would do it five times, and it's called the five whys, right? He would ask why five times until they got to the root issue of what had happened. There's a story of Jeff Bezos going to one of his, uh, one of his uh, uh, warehouses, and uh, the, where the conveyor belt was shut down because uh, one of the employees had hurt their thumb. And he said, why did that happen on a whiteboard? He got some of the managers together. And, it, and they say, well, it got caught in the conveyor belt. His thumb got caught in the conveyor belt. Well, why did that happen? Well, he's chasing after his bag. His bag. Why did he? put his bag on the conveyor belt. Well, he put it there, and then it started up unexpectedly. And Well, why did he do that? Well, he was using it as a table. Well, why was he using the conveyor belt as a table for his personal belongings? And that was because, and they got to the root cause, which is there's no place to store personal belongings. They could solve that problem rather than disciplining, disciplining the guy who's putting his bag on the conveyor belt because you've given him no other place to put it. This process, over and over again, every time there's a problem on the site, the service, the product, doing that process teaches people that we can focus on processes and, and uh, help each other to have a much more safer environment for us to take risks because we won't be pointing fingers at people. We will be looking for root causes of the problem. And that goes a, a tremendous way to building the kind of confidence we need. So let's have a look, right, at all of this stuff. We can zoom right out and start with how we talk about this sense of momentum, right? Sorry, let me just go back here. Uh, the sense of momentum that we can say on a sort of weekly basis from this real-time chat and stuff like that, that the next milestone, uh, sorry, I'm, let me go back one. Try that one more time. That was a good week, right? Lots of progress, nice work everybody. Sorry about the slides advancing. The next milestone, right? Zoom out from weeks and look at milestones. We'll get us to a minimum viable feature that we can, I don't know, ship before South by Southwest, right? We go from real time to the daily, to the weekly, to the zooming out to think about these milestones. We can zoom out a bit further. We can say we're going to focus on performance and, and distribution as themes for all of our milestones in there, right? So the team knows why am I doing this feature at all times. Why are we focused on that stuff? We can measure our vision in years. And we can say, look, like this is the one we had at Google and I found it really, really focusing. We were gonna organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. Right, that was Google's mission. This is what we're doing. This is why we created the company. But what about the timeless, right? What about the overall reason that we are doing this stuff at all? This is what I would sort of get at when we'd be doing interviewing. How do we grow the team? I would ask people, what problem are you passionate about solving? And why do you want to do that here? Why is this the place to do it? Which assumes that the job that you're going to be taking with us fits into a larger notion of what problems you're trying to solve. And it leads to fantastic conversations with people. I love these questions. So let me give you a sense of, of how we think about that. This is uh, ikigai, is how you pronounce those uh, Japanese. It's probably not, but it's as close as I could get to this Japanese concept of the meaning of life, right? There's lots of different ways that we talk about it. The French call it the raison d'etre. The, uh, the sort of Judeo-Christian tradition talks about the divine will. The um, sort of Eastern uh, Buddhist tradition talks about enlightenment. This notion of like, why do we do this stuff? I found this great example, actually, that I found fits really well when we think about this. It is uh, from the original, not the Disney version, but the original 
Winnie the Pooh, where these two are walking down the pathway, and a piglet asks the bear, when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you say to yourself? Well, Winnie the Pooh says, what's for breakfast? Right, of course. <laughs> and how about you, piglet? And then the pig says back to the bear, I say, I wonder what's going to happen exciting today. And then the bear says, well, it's the same thing. <laughs> I wonder what's going to happen that's exciting today. I actually believe we can foster this in our teams, that we can cultivate a sense of, oh my God, what are we gonna do today? Leap out of bed, have this sense, right? The Japanese have even done studies of this, that having a sense of what your reason for being is leads to longevity. People live longer. When they have this sense of, I know what I'm doing, and I don't have enough time, so I gotta get up and go do this, this is so exciting momentum in a timeless scale. When I think about the one that we did, that we worked on for Typekit, we saw it as a fundamental part of the web. And I can zoom all the way out then, zoom all the way back and say, in human civilization, one of the most defining character, character traits of a successful civilization is this, is literacy. It's the fact that a society can learn something and they need not be present for that understanding to perpetuate in the world, that we can share knowledge with each other without physical proximity or even being alive at the same time. Literacy is the most important thing, right? This goes back to the dawn of civilization. And each bit of technology that we collectively work on, right, all of the new stuff that we're building is better versions of this. Right? We started by taking technology and amplifying out these ideas from the printing press to these vast storage facilities of knowledge that were still isolated into one place to making that digital so that we could move it across wires and making it personal so we could all part participate in that. And every bit of technology that we develop just makes us better at connecting with each other and sharing this information. Instilling this in our teams, right? That we don't know where the future is going, but I bet it will be about connecting with each other and sharing what we've learned. Gives people this unbelievable sense, I think, of what is possible and what we're doing. So think about just this vastness of what we've created now and what part you can make with your teams in a sense of momentum, sense of leadership, so that you feel excited when you wake up in the morning. Thank you very much.